So I was at a coding workshop recently as a coach and mentor, and I was there teaching some people how to code. In this workshop, the students had little to no experience with programming, and I have a little more than eight years of experience coding, so I did know a bit more than them. And they were supposed to do different projects. One of the students was stuck at one of the projects. They then called me over to help them. I went over to their desk, looked at it, and suggested a fix. They implemented the fix, and it seemed to work. Everything was great. And then they said something that was somehow stuck in my head. They said, how are you right all the time? And I was like, huh, that did feel very good and validating. But very quickly, I realized that the only reason why I was right in those instances was because I had been wrong so many more times before that. This video is going to be a trip down memory lane of some different projects that I've worked on where I have been wrong. It's going to be a bit of tea sessions and story times, as well as learning from my mistakes, seeing what I could have done differently if I were to do it again and what you should never do. I'm going to talk about three different projects. The first is going to be an autonomous vehicle. So this is a software and hardware project and the premise of it is really, really interesting. The second project is going to be a potential startup idea that I had and we tried implementing it. We even got funding for it. So that's going to be like a app. And the third project is going to be something I'm working on right now. It's going to be a bunch of story times, so let's go. The first coding project is very, very interesting. This was something that I did in year two of university. And because I studied computer engineering, I also had to take some electrical engineering modules. So this was part of an introduction to electrical engineering module. And there was a 25% lab assignment. As part of the lab assignment, we had to actually create an autonomous vehicle, so like a self-driving car. And this car was supposed to race on a track that was provided by the lab assistants. This track was going to be black in color and the table was going to be white. So then we had to use things like light sensors to detect where the car should go. The type of tools that we were given were an Arduino, some circuit boards, wires, wheels for the car, light sensors. I paired with another girl and it was pretty good in the beginning until it wasn't. In this project, I decided to handle the hardware side of things because I, for some reason, thought that hardware would be a lot easier than software. It was like, how hard can it be? It's just wires and you know, you just plug wires. That doesn't sound hard at all. I was so wrong. When you're given a circuit board and you have wires that you need to stick in or like connect the board, you need to solder it. Soldering is basically a process to join metal parts to create electrical bond. I was responsible for soldering and I thought how important can it be? I would just put one shot of solder metal, I don't remember what it's called, on every wire and just get it done really quickly. Totally underestimating the importance of it. By day three or something, we had the code working, we had all the wires done, we had our Arduino set up and we had everything plugged in together. We then tested the car. It was moving, it was running and it seemed to work fine. Then we came to the lab the next day and suddenly the car wasn't working anymore. So we were like, what did we change? We didn't change the code. The car was the way that it is. Probably nobody touched it. So what went wrong? We also had to demo the car in two days where it was supposed to be a race against other teams and that was going to decide the grade that we get. So we were very scared because if this car was not going to run, we were not going to get our lab assignment grade. We got the help from some lab TAs. TAs is technical assistants. Those are usually senior students who are walking around for help. One of the TAs came to our table, looked at our car and checked for connections, told us that the connections between our wires were failing because they were not soldered properly. And that was totally my fault. Turns out, soldering is important after all. In fact, one of the most important things in electrical engineering or like when building electrical things. We then had to redo everything. And when I say everything, I mean everything. At the end of the day, the basic functionality worked so we could still demo our car and that was fine. But what really sucked is that we couldn't enhance our car so add like some more features that would make us stand apart and get an even better grade because we were spending time fixing something that I should have gotten right in the beginning. So lesson learned, 
don't underestimate anything in engineering of any sort. Like now, even when I work on a considerably small feature, I still put in the same amount of effort as I would in a larger feature like writing tests or just making sure I'm covering all the bases because you never know what small thing is going to fail and when it does it's very painful. <laughs> this is actually a very nice segue into the sponsors of this video, Zima Board. Zima Board is a low-cost single board server designed for engineers and shall I say geeks like you and I. I don't want to throw a ton of numbers at you because you can easily check out their specs on their website which I'll link down below. But instead I'm going to talk about how this small device is actually way more fabulous than you think it is. One of the best users that I found for the Zima board is to make use of their Casa OS, which actually lets you do a lot of different things. The first one being to set up your own personal cloud. But what is a personal cloud? Imagine it being your own personal Dropbox or Google Drive, but now instead of all your data being stored in a large third-party server, it will actually be stored in a hardware device in your home. But you can still access this data online 24-7. You don't have to pay subscription fees and you get 100% privacy over your data. You could even set up ad blocking capabilities for your home network using inbuilt tools like AdGuard Home or Pihole. Another great use of the Zima board, which I'm going to definitely make use of, is to actually build home projects. So I'm personally a big fan of Raspberry Pi. But what distinguishes the Zima board from a Raspberry Pi is its PCI slot which enables you to install a range of expansion cards such as graphics or video cards and sound cards. This is particularly beneficial for developers like myself who are quite interested in developing projects and currently building projects that make use of machine learning or AI and for which a MacBook Air is not sufficient. I've already started playing around with it and setting up my own ad block at home so I don't need to watch ads on certain sites. And I found it to be incredibly flexible. So check them out in the description box down below and stay tuned for some hardware projects on this channel now that I have this. The next project is a bill splitting application that we even got funding for of $10,000. Long story short, I was in year three and part of it was year four of university when we started working on this. By then I had done two software engineering internships and was pretty familiar with front-end development but hadn't really dabbled much with back-end development. There were four of us who started building this in the beginning. We started it off as a hackathon idea so we went to a hackathon, we decided to just try this out and somehow we ended up winning. We then tried this out on other hackathons as well, which we also won. So it turns out that this idea was pretty good. We demoed it to our university's VC, I don't remember what it's called, but it was something like fund. And they were happy with it, so they gave us funding as well. And we started this when we were in San Francisco, and then we all came back to Singapore to finish our last year of university, and we continued to try to build it. There were some people who stayed, some people who left, who recruited new people, but we did try to build it up. For me, because the journey so far had been pretty smooth, everybody who looked at it said it was a great idea, they would use it, we won a few things, so it did seem like pretty smooth so far. So to me, it was like, what can go wrong but I was wrong there were multiple things that went wrong and the first being motivation or passion when working in a team and I think when building startups or pursuing entrepreneurship I think what's more important than an idea or even money is passion because you can have all the money in the world if you're not passionate about your idea if you don't actually want to spend time doing it you're not going to do it you can have all the technical skills in the world but if you don't have passion for what you're building unless you have a gun to you you're probably not going to build it either so for us what we realized was that yeah the idea was good so we decided to pursue it because we got a lot of positive feedback from people around us but it turns out that we were not actually that motivated to build this product. Or at least I myself was not crazy passionate about it. Second thing that went wrong is timing. When we went back to Singapore and started building it for the Singapore audience, 
It was around the same time when D DBS being a very big bank in Singapore came up with their PayLa feature, which was basically to send transfer money across people. And a lot of different food courts in Singapore, like stalls in food courts, uh, ended up using it by putting up QR codes outside their stall and people would have to scan the QR code to pay. So it did make our app pretty redundant. And while we could pivot to work with them instead of making them our competitor, it seemed like a lot of work because now you have a big competitor in the market who has a lot of money, a lot of engineers, is very fast, a lot of data, and there's no way that we, a few university students, were going to compete with that. The third problem was technical skills. Even if the timing had been right, and even if everything was right, I very quickly realized that I did not know enough about building an app from scratch. Yes, I could build a simple app. You can do anything with the internet now, right? You can easily learn stuff online. So I could build something. But I don't think I was equipped with the technical skills to build something that was going to be used by thousands of people, take into account aspects like security, threats, data privacy, and all of these little technical details that are actually very important in large scale. So while the app didn't work because we decided to not work on it anymore and decided to just become engineers in the corporate cycle, but it did teach me a lot of things. I do want to have my own company one day and pursue entrepreneurship again. These things did make me realize that there's a lot I need to learn before I'm ready for that. It made me realize the value of passion, how the idea that I work on has to be something that I'm actually very passionate about. If not, it's never actually going to work. And I also don't want to waste my time doing projects anymore that I don't see myself pursuing or enjoying after a year because that's just going to be very short-lived and I want something that is sustainable. Like for this YouTube channel as well, I did make quite a few videos before I posted my first one and I just wanted to try and see if I even enjoy doing this, if it's sustainable, if it's something that I see myself doing in the long run because if it's something that I don't enjoy, if I'm not passionate about, I don't want to spend even a month doing it because it's not worth it. Next is the video project that I'm working on right now and that's supposed to be an automatic video editor. This project basically is supposed to let you drop in a raw video. When I say raw, footages where I said something wrong, just a long cut of me filming. Now when I'm filming this video, not all of it is going to go on your screens. Instead, you're going to see a very edited version of it. Raw footage in my case would be around 30 minutes or an 8 minutes video. So I will have like 22 minutes of me rambling on, talking nonsense that I probably shouldn't say, pauses, drinking water, pronouncing the wrong words and all those type of things. So that's the raw footage. What I want my video editor to do is to let the user type in how they want the video to be edited. So even things like edit it like Christopher Nolan or remove silences, remove when I say the word, huh, remove when I roll my eyes, things like that. That's my dream vision, which is extremely difficult because it's very hard to do that without machine learning. And I don't have enough hardware to be able to execute this. But I'm starting small. What is my first iteration is to just allow you to upload a video and for me to remove silences. Building something that is actually usable for me, forget about other people, just something that works for every single video that I upload is very difficult. So far, I don't have a working version yet. And Initially, I thought it would be very easy because it's like, how hard can it be to remove silences from a video, right? And there are quite a few ways to do that that I could think of just on the spot. But after actually trying it out and trying to make it work for different types of videos, I then realized that this is a lot harder than I thought and I was wrong. When I coded it out, it didn't work. Then I had to take a step back wasted a lot of hours on that and then I came up with a new algorithm that kind of works better but doesn't work all the time either and my code is a bit buggy right now I still need to fix that and another thing that went wrong is that 
Last month, if I'm not wrong, CapCut released their auto trim feature, which lets you pick and choose pauses and remove them from your video and edit it without even running the video, which is honestly very smart. I didn't even think of that. So basically you activate this tool and then you can choose which bits and pieces you want to keep, which you don't with just the text itself. It's audio to text is not very accurate, at least in my case, but maybe because I have an accent. So maybe that's why, but I don't think it works all the time, but neither does my code. So who knows? So when this came out, I got very demotivated and I haven't really touched this side project for a week now because I just feel like oh the competitor just released the feature so why will my tool even be used and who will even care about it who will even use it and I don't know if it's wrong to think that way or is it wrong to keep working on something when there's already somebody out there doing it better than you I don't. But so far, I feel like I've been wrong on quite a few things related to this project. Fortunately, because I'm still working on it, I don't have any solutions or lessons so far. But I will keep you updated on how it goes. With that being said, we come to the end of our trip down memory lane. If you enjoyed watching this video, let me know in the comments down below. If you want to hear of more projects, because I have quite a few projects in my arsenal, I'm happy to talk about it. I also wanted to go a bit more technical, but I then decided I don't know who even cares about it. In fact, I filmed a video where I went into technical details of these projects and talked about like the spec as well as some UML diagrams and all those type of things and showing you the code. But I don't know, I decided not to edit that video because I wasn't very happy with it and didn't know who would care about it. I hope you liked this one. And if you have any questions, if you want to hear how I am going to go about building this video editor, you can reach me on the comments below, email or discord, and I will try my best to answer any questions that you have. With that being said, thank you so much for watching. I had fun filming this and remembering old projects and mistakes that I made and I hope to see you in the next one.